Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Creative Mischief by Dave Trott. Dave Trott is uh, a marketing thought leader. He has a very unique writing style, which you'll see soon when I get to reading excerpts, where he writes in short sentences. And he does a lot of his stuff, he sort of tells stories and then, you know, invites you to then apply that and to learn from them. So in this book, Creative Mischief, is very much telling the stories of some creative mischief makers. And then we as, you know, entrepreneurs, business people, or just general citizens of the world can then learn from that. So I'm going to start by reading the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs before sharing my overall thoughts and rating at the end. I was going to read the blurb, but there isn't a blurb. There is an introduction, which I've tabbed, so we'll do that. For me, there are two requirements from anything I read. I have to learn something, or I have to be entertained. If I'm not getting either of those two, why would I keep reading? The best advertising works because it's creative. We can find creativity everywhere, and we can all learn from it wherever we find it. I can learn lessons from creativity about Muhammad Ali, Mike Tyson, Max Baer, Vince Lombardi, Billy Bean, Brian Clough, Tony Adams, Jackie Stewart, Bill Shankly, Ellen MacArthur, Napoleon Bonaparte, Horatio Nelson, Heinz Guderian, Michael Whitman, Willie Messerschmidt, Woody Allen, George Carlin, Jackie Mason, Joe Brand, Rupert Murdoch, Richard Branson, Winston Churchill, Norman Tebbett, Tony Benn, Pablo Picasso, Damien Hirst, Tintoretto, Orson Welles, Alfred Hitchcock, Emma Thompson, Clint Eastwood, Steven Spielberg, William of Ockham, Mary Wollstonecraft, Jean-Paul Sartre and Ernie Bilko. All of these guys said or did something that made me go, wow, I wish I'd thought of that. Just look at the cover of the Sgt. Pepper album. That's the Beatles putting all their creative influences in one photograph. And that was something I poured over at art school. What did they like? Why did they like all these people? What was good about them? I wanted to know what I could learn from them. Whatever excites us will probably be something really clever. It will be good to read. Although advertising can be very creative, it isn't the only form of creativity. It's applied creativity. And there are lots of other forms of applied creativity. So where else can we find it being applied? What else took our breath away when we heard or saw it? And what can we learn from it? What can we take away and use? join up the dots. So this bit is part of Creative Mischief, the very first uh, sort of entry. I'm not going to read the full thing here, I just want to read enough for you to get the, the feel for this story. When I worked at BMP, the head of television commuted in from Brighton every day. He started reading The Exorcist on the train. He said he thought it was the most evil book he'd ever read. In fact, he said it was so evil he couldn't finish it. So at the weekend, he went to the end of Brighton Pier and threw it in as far as he could. So I went to the bookshop. I bought another copy. Then I ran it under the tap and left it in his desk drawer for him to find. As Dawn French says, if it's funny, it's not bad taste. And if it's bad taste, it's not funny. So I want to read here this interesting little bit about the spoken word versus the printed word and kind of the origins of swearing. A couple of years back, Radio 4 ran a program on the history of swearing and how it started. Apparently, it was the Victorians who invented the concept. It didn't exist before them. The words existed, of course, but not the concept that some words were unfit for use. What caused the invention of swearing was the advent of road signs. With the Victorians came the need to formalise every address, so they could supply sewage to every house, gas or electric, mail delivery, everything we now take for granted. The problem was London had grown organically over 2,000 years. Streets just happened to be pathways between groups of houses. They acquired nicknames that were just a way to describe them. So you might tell someone to go to the street with all the blacksmiths. This would pretty soon be shortened to Blacksmith Street, which is how we got Butcher Street or Baker Street or Leather Lane. But the problem was slang. For instance, a street of stables might be known as Horseshit Road, because that was its most noticeable feature. The BBC said one alley that prostitutes used was known as Grope Cunt Lane. Before the advent of road signs, this wasn't a problem. Polite Victorian society wouldn't have any reason to talk about these streets, much less walk down them. But suddenly every street was going to have its name printed in large black and white letters of where everyone could see it. Grope Cunt Street just wasn't going to happen. There was a typo there as well, it said named instead of name. Grope Cunt Lane just wasn't going to happen. So a lot of streets had to be renamed, and a list of unfit words was compiled, and the concept of swearing was born. Grope Cunt Lane, for instance, had to be renamed as Great Lane. The main point being, when you see something written down, it has a much more in-your-face quality than something merely spoken. When John Major was Prime Minister, he knew his own party were against him, and called them a bunch of shits. The next day, Sue Douglas, editor of the Sunday Express, ran that as the front page headline, Bunch of Shits. She was fired. Somehow it was much more powerful to see it than just to hear it. So I want to read this little excerpt from Context is Everything. Mark Twain tells the story of a young boy he met in the Midwest. Every time a stranger came into town, the other boys delighted in showing the stranger just how stupid this boy was. 
They'd hold out two coins, a dime, ten cents, and a nickel, five cents, and tell the boy he could keep one. He'd always pick the nickel because it was bigger. Every time he did it, all the other boys laughed. Mark Twain took him aside and said, Son, I have to tell you that the small coin is worth more than the bigger one. The boy said, I know that, mister, but how many times do you think they'd let me choose if I picked the more valuable one? In the original context, the boy is stupid. Change the context, and he's smart. So uh, here, under the, the section positioning, he says, um, to have a brand, you need an identity. To have an identity, you need a point of difference. And if you don't have one, you need to create one. For example, supposing I asked the question, who was the first American president? Most people would be able to answer George Washington. But if I asked who was the 44th American president, a lot less people would be able to answer. You can't remember all the American presidents and what order they came in. Why would you? But it was Obama. I mean, I just know that. He tells a story about uh, when his kids were learning to swear, which is quite endearing. And this is interesting because I specifically picked university and college courses that were coursework heavy as opposed to exam heavy because I think that exams just reward people who like cram the most information over a short period of time. I, and also I just enjoy coursework because <laughs> I'm a nerd. So here he says advertising and sex. Uh, and, and the reason I say that is because I kind of book the, ch the trend for my gender. A few years back I read an article in The Spectator. It was by Madsen Piri, the chairman of the Adam Smith Institute. He was writing about the phenomenon that, in the UK, girls were passing more exams than boys. He was interested in the reason behind this. Some people thought it was because more girls were being allowed to take exams at a higher level. Madsen Piri said this wasn't the answer. Some people thought it was proof that girls have always been more intelligent, but until now they hadn't been allowed to show it. Madsen Piri said this wasn't the answer either. He said everyone was looking in the wrong place for the answer. The reason girls were passing more exams than boys wasn't actually to do with girls' intelligence at all. It was to do with the exams themselves. At about the time when girls began passing more exams than boys, exams had changed. The, the examination authorities had begun giving 50% of the marks for the coursework done in the year leading up to the exam. Previously, 100% of the marks had been for the final exam itself. Coursework hadn't counted for anything. This suited boys, who would do as little as possible all year, and cram like crazy in the last weeks before the exam. Then it changed, and 50% of the marks were given for coursework. This suited girls, who would work steadily and conscientiously all year so that by the time of the final exam, they would already have more marks than the boys. And however hard the boys crammed for the final exam, it was only worth 50% of the marks. I don't know, I hesitate to make sweeping generalizations like that. But anyway, overall, Creative Mischief by Dave Trott, I did enjoy it. Uh, it's one of those books that's good to read just to give you some inspiration. Trott has this very unique writing style as well, which I do quite enjoy, although it becomes overkill, so like this book is pretty much just the right length. Again, um, probably not for everyone, but if you're entrepreneurial or you like to think you are, or you just are a creative person in general, Creative Mischief by Dave Trott is probably worth a read. I gave it a four out of five. So there we have it, that's what I thought of Creative Mischief by Dave Trott. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it, hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot, bye-bye.